people who have made a connection to the choices they're making and their future selves, their self center lights up. And they're going to have willpower, they're going to have more self love, etc. People that don't make those connections, and again, you can cultivate these connections, their stranger self lights up. So of course, they don't treat their future self with love, because they're not even connected to it. So if you can make wow. the connection to the gifts that this version of you is lovingly giving to the tomorrow morning version of you, I mean, you don't need to wait 20 years, 20 minutes from now, I, my future self will appreciate whether how I treat my kids and whether I go on the cold plunge, like I said, I would after we get off the talk, like these are <laughs> gifts we're giving to ourselves, you know what I mean? And, and anyway, we want to make those connections, but love is everything. Hey friends, Dr. Motley here with the Ancient Health Podcast. And today we have a very special guest, Brian Johnson. Brian Johnson comes to us from Austin, Texas, and he just completed a really, really good book, Arate. And he helps develop people in their strengths. He coaches, he helps them with finding the hero within themselves. And we wanted to have him on this podcast because we've had in this world today, in this day and age, there's such fear, such dread, there's things going on. And many of you out there want some direction or love to hear the ideas of those who are strong in their direction and pathway. So Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're really glad to have you here. Chris, I appreciate you. I'm excited to be here. And as I said, I'm already feeling, what was it? Chill, just chilled out chilled. For a while in your presence. Let's go. Dude, I love it. And and um, for all of you guys out there that's listening, Brian has got, you could tell with the energy that we, we came on here with, he's got the motivation that you can tell it's just oozing out of him. So we got some good questions for you, my friend. And so we're going to go through these questions, but we don't want anybody out there to think that we're trying to be robotico. We want it to be really flourishing, just like really, really moving very easily. But first of all, everybody wants to hear about who you are. I do. I want to hear about like what gets you rolling and who you are, where you're at, and what got you into doing what you do. Yeah. So as you said, you know, I spent 50% philosopher, 50% CEO, but I spent half of the last 25 years as a founder CEO, and the other half reading and writing and thinking and, and a philosopher in the most etymological sense of the word, a lover of wisdom. But before that, I, I suffered a lot. So I grew up youngest of five, you know, conservative blue collar Catholic family. My dad struggled with alcohol. His dad struggled with alcohol, ended his own life. And I can joke now that, you know, I kind of lost both apparently the environmental and the genetic lottery on that one. And I know what it feels, feels like to feel kind of the depths of that despair, yet mm -hmm. also always had this passion for understanding what is it that makes truly great, flourishing people who are making a difference in the world um, tick. And so I've spent a ton of time just really trying to understand ancient wisdom, modern science, and then distill it into practical tools that people can use to show up more consistently as their best selves. Um, and that's what fires me up. You know, Heroic Public Benefit Corporation tattooed my body with that and with our goal. Um, other arms, the way we achieve, you know, that that heroic life, which is to live with Arte, which, of course, is the name of the book. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of a super quick snapshot of who I am and, and part of what drives me. I really love the um, the fact that when you talk about how your struggles and how the, I guess the setbacks that we could perceive as setbacks, because many things in our life do set us back and many things are hurtful. But I love that you gave us your philosophies in this book about how you did overcome them and how you've helped so many thousands do it. And we're going to go through some thoughts, some questions with you. And remember, it's a good conversation. So everybody out there, you got to check this book out because the one thing I really appreciated was that he not only went through the philosophical aspects, he says he's a philosophy, a philosopher and a teacher, but he also went through some of like the physical practical aspects. Like he talks about cold showers, cold baths. He talks about things you could physically put your body through to actually help your mentality. So we're going to go into that too, which I love uh, really well, Brian. So first off, now how can individuals, how can they build this anti-fragile confidence? How can they build it through their own actions? What can they do? 
Yeah, let me step back for a second and just frame up Arate. So just you know, people may be wondering, oh, what is Arate? Arate is the one word answer that the ancient Stoics, the ancient Greek philosophers would give on how to live a good life. Literally a single word, arate, which we translate as virtue or excellence, but means something closer to being your best self moment to moment to moment. And I like to say, if you're capable of being this, I'm drawing a line in my eyes and, and you're actually being this, a line a foot below that, and there's a gap between who you could be in any given moment and who you're actually being, it's in that gap where regret, anxiety, disillusionment exist. Now, with that context, in the book, I talk about Objective two is forging anti-fragile confidence. Um, and everything we do goes on these seven objectives. Objective one is you got to know the ultimate game. Most people are seduced to play the wrong game. Let me go after the extrinsic fame, wealth, hotness, et cetera. But science is unequivocal. If you go after those, even if you're succeeding, you won't be as happy or psychologically stable is how they put it, compared to people that are going after the intrinsic stuff, becoming a better person, deepening relationships, making a contribution to your family. But then objective two is forge anti-fragile confidence. And this is my favorite part of everything I do in our app, in the coaching vacation, and in the book. So defining terms, anti-fragile and confidence. Anti-fragile is a Nassim Taleb word that he coined because there was no opposite to fragile before he came up with anti-fragile. We know about you know resilience, but what about if, you, if you're fragile and life hits you and everybody has gotten hit hard in general, but particularly over the last, you know, three, four or five years. And, and just when you thought the world couldn't get any worse, the last 30 days happen. So when life hits you, what happens? Do you break? Are you fragile or are you resilient and you can handle more stress Then you kind of break down and then you bounce back faster? Or are you anti-fragile? When life hits you, do you actually get stronger? Because that's why we go to the gym. That's why I do a cold plunge. The hormetic stress is making me stronger. I'm going to push myself deliberately. So what if when life hits us, instead of going off the rails and doing all the things we know we shouldn't be doing, we doubled down on our protocol? If we mm. did that, we'd cultivate a deep level of confidence. Um, and we can talk more about what that means. But but. And we can talk about my coach, Phil Stutz, who gave me kind of the original idea here, who's featured in the Netflix documentary called Stutz. Um, but that's the idea of anti-fragility. And we can talk about specific means that I think people can cultivate that. But I know I've already said a lot. So I'll pause and check in and see where you want to go. No, no, no. I like it that we talk about anti-fragile and like how you compare it, because um, I love the fact that you have Arte. I love the title, by the way. That is something that I, I was wondering, too, where you got that from. And uh, with the fragile confidence, um, do you find that when you are dealing with people that you're coaching, that in our day and age, is there, uh, sometimes I find that people when they are confident or when they exude confidence, that there's, there's a feeling of like, I'm not being humble. I'm getting too high minded because I, I do believe that you're starting to see in our culture today, like if you say too much, or if you act confidence, that means you're just being cocky. But that can pull a lot of people down. What would you have to say to, to that? Because I know there's some people out there that that want to live confident, but they're just too shy and they're afraid what other people are going to say. And they never really grasp that confidence in yeah. life just normally. It's a, it's a really important distinction. I think I think true confidence, which we can define as well, is deeply humble. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's an you know, cockiness and, and kind of the arrogance of I've got it all figured out. That's not true confidence. And that's not how I approach it. So confidence, I'm kind of an etymology nerd. So confidence comes from the ancient Latin words, con and fidere, um, which means intense trust. So true confidence is intense trust in yourself. Basically, not that things will go perfectly, but that you have what it takes to respond to whatever happens. And then the way that I frame it up is, look, if you want to build trust in any relationship, how do you do that? So if I want to trust you and you want to trust me, what do we got to do? We've got to do what we say we will do. Then I would be trustworthy, you would be trustworthy, and we have a relationship that we have confidence in. Now, if you want to have trust in yourself and truly have grounded confidence, you need to do what you say you're going to do. 
So if I say I'm going to meditate in the morning and I'm going to turn my electronics off when with my kids, or I'm going to do the cold plunge, which I'm going to do after we get off today, now I'm going to go to bed at a certain time and I'm going to do the things I know are best for me and I don't, I shouldn't have confidence. I shouldn't trust myself because I haven't done the things I said I would do. Now I'm being very blunt, but to state it positively, when you start, not perfectly, but more and more consistently doing the things that you know you should do, especially when you don't feel like them, when the life hits you hard, then you cultivate this anti-fragile confidence. Uh, again, Phil Stutz calls that emotional stamina. Phil mm -hmm. was in the documentary with Jonah Hill called Stutz on Netflix, which is amazing. I've worked with him. We've done 400 one-on-one -on -one sessions, more than anybody else has ever done with him. And he works with all of Hollywood's elite and all that stuff, as you know, if you've seen the, the documentary. But in one of our first chats, he complimented me on something he called emotional stamina. He's like, oh, you got a lot of emotional stamina. I'm like, I have no idea what that is, but that sounds cool. Thanks. Next, <laughs> next session, I'm like, hey, what's emotional stamina? He said, well, you can handle you know, pressure from life and, and you, you respond well. And he said, here's what you need to know. In order to cultivate emotional stamina, which I've adapted to anti-fragile confidence, you got to do this. The worse you feel, the more committed you are to your protocol. So the mm -hmm. worse you feel, the more committed you are to your protocol. That presupposes you know your protocol, that you know who you are when you're at your best and what you do. And then when you feel most challenged, you dust off that checklist, that protocol, and you double down on your, your basic fundamentals. And then again, the things that used to destroy you make you stronger. That's the essence of anti-fragile confidence. And again, that's, that's the thing I'm most excited about in my work and what I've helped people transform their lives with, because you get 3%, 5%, 10% better at that. Mm -hmm. you, you cultivate a level of, um, it's hard to put into words, it's not invincibility, but pretty darn close, um, knowing you've got what it takes to respond no matter what life throws at you. Definitely. Like when you say that there's a, like there's a level like you say, you know, dust the, you know, the dust off or just shake off the dust. Like when you create um, that work ethic, like, you know, like basically is the word potential or like how much you're able to take and how much you can actually put out there. When we're talking about development, um, I think we need to develop ourselves to get stronger, right? Like, cause you can then know your capacity if that's what you're saying. Like, cause many people out there like myself, it's, you know, if I didn't even know what my capacity was, then how can I really challenge myself, which I think is a very beautiful portion of your book. So you do talk about self-development in the concept of, you call it the big three. And you're talking about energy, you're talking about work, you talk about love. To build yourself up, how do you utilize those big three to like anybody out there that says, how can I cultivate myself and develop to know what my potentials are? Yeah. Yeah. The way that we frame it up is uh, oftentimes, at least for me, when I got into self-development, you know, 25 years ago, I had more hair and less gray whiskers, you know, getting into <laughs> Tony Robbins, or Stephen Covey first and then Tony Robbins. And it, it can get overwhelming fast. You know, Covey talked about roles and goals. Mm -hmm. Tony Robbins talks about categories of improvement, but there's so many areas of my life. I don't know where to begin. Right. Um, and I, I found myself overwhelmed. And then Freud's, and Freud, with whom I don't agree on most things, but I do think he got it right when he said a good life comes down to two things, your work and your love. If you can get yourself optimized in those two domains, you're doing pretty well. To which I say yes, and if your energy isn't where it needs to be and you have a hard time getting out of bed because of poor lifestyle choices, good luck showing up in either your work or your love. So we call that the big three, energy, work, and love. And to your point, I obsess about the fundamentals. A good life starts with energy. I mean, even scientists say the number one virtue most highly correlated with our flourishing is zest, a sense of vitality. And if you aren't prioritizing your basic fundamentals, as you know better than anyone, eating, moving, sleeping, breathing, and focusing your mind, um, you know, you're going to have a tough time. So that, that's our big three. And then we help you get clarity on who you are at your best in your energy, work, and love. We help you create an identity, um, which literally means repeated beingness. So you want to visualize who you are at your best. Then you want to repeatedly be that best version of yourself. And then again, you want a protocol. And the reality is all of us have performed at a very high level. We've been in at least one level of relative to where we may be today, energetic 
you know, great shape and vitality. We've been productive. We've been connected to our loved ones. So what were you doing when you were at your best in your energy, work, and love? And what are you not currently doing that you need to start doing more of? Um, and then we kind of start architecting that protocol in a practical sense, um, create a checklist that we can use as we go through our days, which will help us show up and experience more joy and meaning, et cetera. And take agency in a world that's as chaotic as ours is. We need to take more, um, not just responsibility, but true response ability. Like we can choose our response to all the things going on in the world. We can demonstrate agency, we can maintain hope, and then we can create plans to create a better life. Um, and that's the uh, that's the ultimate mission and, and kind of message of the book. And ultimately, you're the hero we've been waiting for. You know, we're facing historically significant challenges from my mind, and we can't look out our look outside of ourselves. We need to look in the mirror and say, all right, how am I called to show up? Um, what can I do to serve my family and my community more profoundly? Um, and then as I like to say, let's go. Today's the day. That's right. Let's go. As, I mean, I love this, uh, Brian. I what I know you talked about your family story, like you know, about you know your dad and his family life about having struggles with alcohol. And I know that those impacted you. I know this, we're going on a side note. I just want to know, like, was there a specific time in your life that when you knew that you're going to go and help other individuals find out their potential, find out what was inside? Was there a, like a moment or maybe there wasn't, but was there some things that happened in your life that just sort of kept pushing you? Like just sort of, because other people love to know what motivated you to go. I'm making this decision. I'm doing this. Was yep. there any time like that in your life? Yeah. And again, to frame it up a bit more, I, I gave a keynote talk for a big bank on mental health day um, mm -hmm. just not too long ago. And the, I started out this, the presentation with a picture of my family at a wedding um, where everybody looked super happy. And, and one of the things, the themes was invisible disabilities. 80% of us are struggling with anxiety and depression or some form of mental challenges. That's insane. And the biggest issue that I had back in the day was I thought it was just me. But in this picture, it's a happy family. My three sisters, one of them's getting married, my brother um, and my mom and dad. But what you didn't see because it was invisible was my dad was struggling. My brother was struggling with the same thing. One of my sisters was actually went through some serious issues. I had wanted to end my own life a year and a half before would go yeah. into a dark space six months later, but it was invisible. So the story we're telling ourselves that I used to tell myself that something was wrong with me was the root of even more suffering. But for whatever reason, I've, I've, I've uh, always had a passion for helping, you know, uh, and just doing my best to serve. And I've also always been passionate about um, what I can do, you know, at, at a significant level. And, and, you know, I dropped out of law school and I had no idea what I wanted to do, which is when I first struggled. And I had this much energy and no sense of how I would apply it to the world. I threw up on the way home from work on the 405 after I started my career. I'm like, there's no way I'm doing that for the rest of my life. <laughs> and so, you know, but, but I, I wanted to understand it, you know, and I, I've studied, you know, psychology as an undergrad and just, just immersed myself in all of the ancient wisdom, all of the modern science. And then I kind of made a deal with God, whatever you want to call it, that I'd be blessed to study this to the extent I embodied it and I taught it as I went. And that's what I've been doing for the last 25 years is just trying to figure out a really practical way to operationalize all of this ancient wisdom, all of the modern science in the modern world. Um, you know, and there's a lot of other things we can talk about, but uh, uh, impossible to articulate exactly what it is and what led to it. But it's been a lifelong pursuit for me. Um, and that's what it means to be heroic is to figure out who you are, what you're here to do and to do your best, whether anyone ever hears about you or not. Um, again, longer chat, we can talk about the fact that my wife's more heroic than me. Most people don't know who she <laughs> is and what she's doing, but she's, what she does for our kids is truly heroic. So redefining that and then giving people those practical tools to show up and conquer whatever anxiety, depression, disillusionment they may have, and or go to the next, next, next level. You know, we've been blessed to work with the highest level military officers, executives, athletes, coaches, and people who wanted to end their own lives, and um, each of which resonate with with different aspects of my story and our work. Mm, I, I love this because 
I see like even through your work in the book, it's that when we look at our own personality, when we find the hero, like somebody's more heroic, I also love that you take glimpses into your life and, and in your stories here in the book about how you you don't neglect like the other parts of your personality. Like, let's say, you know, there are times when we can act like the villain or we can act like the, you know, if we feel like we're the victim. And so you take that and you put it into this book to where you can actually say, OK, this is how I can achieve and be the hero within my own story. And there's a lot of good points that um, that I've seen. And I'm going to go through some of these that I've uh, earmarked that I went through. Um, but we, there's one thing that I loved is that you talked about every day making a day like a masterpiece. And you are really adamant, and which I love, about how do I create the start of my day? How do I end my day? Because yep. I tell you personally, my friend, it, like I, that's very important to me. Like Because I realize like it sets the, the tone. What do you do? What, what is your thoughts? about how a person should start or how they should finish it, man. Cause you, you do it so eloquently in the book though. I appreciate that. And again, this is now the fourth objective to make today a masterpiece, you know, and we got to, today's the day to move from theory to practice to mastery. But the way we frame it up is um, I lean on a lot, 200 different teachers in the books. There's 451 little micro chapters and ideas, 200 different teachers are referenced. Um, Darren Hardy, uh, used to be the editor of Success Magazine, wrote The Compound Effect. He he has a great frame. He says, look, you have more control over the beginning and the end of your day than the middle of your day. He calls them mm-hmm. AM and PM bookends. And I love that. And I've adopted that. So imagine your ideal day. You can draw it as like a rectangle on a piece of paper. AM, PM. Look at your AM, look at your PM. But then what you want to recognize is the fact that today started yesterday. So how you ended yesterday is directly influencing the energy with which you wake up today. So we're doing this in the afternoon. I'm going to shut down completely. I'm going to hop in the cold plunge and I'm done. Phones off, emails done. I'm going to recover while I connect with my family such that I can get a good night of sleep, such that I can wake up feeling great. So again, today began yesterday. And you can literally change your life overnight. Almost all of us need an extra hour of sleep slash in bed. And again, if you're not getting, and you know this better than anybody, if you're not getting the recommended seven to eight hours of sleep, you're not thriving at the level that you could. Your baseline has been reset. You're used to a a deeper level of lethargy than you need to have. And let's prioritize getting a good night of sleep. Let's move back, you know, your alarm from trying to wake up in the morning to, no, no, no. When are you going to shut down, create those PM routines, um, and then there's a lot of other details, but that's by far the biggest thing that that I do every day. It's on my checklist. What do I do when I'm on? I'm in bed for at least eight to nine hours. I'm getting my, for me, I love eight, eight and a half hours of sleep. I'm alive. I'm going to go to bed yeah. 45 minutes, 60 minutes after the sun sets. After we tuck in our kids, it, time just changed, dude. I'm going to bed by 7 p.m. You know, I'm getting up without an alarm at whatever time yeah. I get up, you know, 4.40, 4.30, whatever, like feeling great, eight and a half hours, 8.45 of sleep, ready to go. I feel a lot better on those days than I do on the days that I get six hours of sleep. So we want to make the obvious connections and then prioritize um, creating our own lives to be heroic rather than watching these pseudo heroes on Netflix or sports channel, whatever it is that we do. Um, And again, you got to show up like you mean it. Um, And the whole point of the book on that is you got to activate. That's the subtitle to the book activation energy as you know is a scientific thing nothing happens if you want to boil water at 200 degrees 210 211 you got to get it to 212 you want to make a fire you have to get to 451 degrees one thing becomes another thing so we need to show up with a grounded you know calm confident but intensity that this isn't a dress rehearsal when there are things we can do to create a life of deeper meaning um, and that masterpiece day idea and good nights of sleep <laughs> and training exactly. to recovery, you know, are so essential to it. Oh, uh, I mean, I love that when you say the, the idea, not even the idea, the fact of consistency, like when you go to bed, like I, I will say that whenever I get less than for me, it's like seven and a half hours, I need to get at least seven and a half hours. 
And I've, I've noticed that I've cherished and made it a point to cherish sleep and find mm-hmm. things that could be a positive impact on my life. That, like I need to cherish that and, and give it reverence in my life. And that's why I think that when you say you have uh, not just habits and traits, are there things that you find that that you do that you started off with to the people you coach? Like maybe the first top two or three things, maybe just one thing that you say, practice this, like going to sleep, practice this, and you'll see a positive change in your life. Like if you just do it like often, if you do it consistently, is there anything like that somebody could just jumpstart in and try to get things going? Yeah, I mean, the number one book, and again, you mentioned we've trained 10,000 people from 100 coaches in our in our coach program. We talk about all these ideas, but the one book I, I recommend they read um, is Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. I mean, the science of sleep is huge. I think there are a few more powerful things. And then there's the obvious, you know, quit drinking your sugar and over-consuming refined foods and the fact that your gut's producing 80 to 85, 90% of your body's serotonin. All right, cool. How you doing with... The nutrition side and then the movement obviously is important not over training or under training um so th- those are all fundamentals that we teach each one of which can have an effect of course meditation etc but the way that i like to do it is um a little exercise where people take out a piece of paper they draw a line down the middle on the upper left put do on the upper right put don't and mm-hmm. think about a time in your life when you felt great when you were showing up powerfully, your energy was dialed in, you were productive and you were connected, energy working well. What were you doing? Because you've experienced the success you, you may feel is missing right now, but what mm-hmm. were you doing when you're at your best? Make a list of it. And what were you not doing? Which is oh. paradoxically the fastest way to change your life is to quit doing the things that are draining your power, the kryptonites we call them. But anyway, you make a list of what you were doing at your best, what you weren't doing, And then circle one thing that you're not currently doing that if you did that thing, you think and you're excited to do it. You're not doing it because you think you have to. You're actually inspired by it. You're committed to figuring out how to install that habit um, and circle that and do that. And then think about the thing you need to stop doing. Um, And again, it will be different for each of us. But I try to find a structure that makes sense, but that's universally true. Mm -hmm. Um, But then it's idiosyncratically expressed in the individual's kind of um, unique life and the constraints of their life. Um, But that's how we approach it is, and I do this all the time. Anytime I want to go next, next level, it's what's the number one start, number one stop, um, time to get on it, you know? I love that. Like when you make lists, um, with this, when you have that, what thing that I could be doing, and I find that like even in healthcare, when I like working with patients, it's um, I think that when you give a, a person like those feasible goals, like, you know, they're doing every like, you know, they drink enough water, they're getting enough sleep. And then all of a sudden you say, OK, hey, you're right. You, you're having too much sugar. There could be some bacterial imbalances. Let's be consistent about like uh, cutting out, you know, this food. But also adding something into your life, like adding in, like if it was, uh, if it was a supplement or a probiotic or something of that sort. And when you look about how you can make those, those fundamental changes, to me, it's like the smallest movements I find with my patients sometimes make their biggest changes. And I, and I'm really, really surprised about the psychology behind that. Are there like, I love psychology, but I'm not as adv- like I'm not in tune like you are with psychology. Just on a side note, do you are there certain books that well, along with your book, of course, but was there certain, you know, books that you like to read that would help you like that gave you a jump start? Because people just love to know what inspires you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love all the ancient stoic classics. Ryan Holiday did a great job with the daily stoic, the obstacle is the way. And then James Clear. I mean, his atomic habits is the best selling book. Yeah. Uh, modern times for a reason. He's done a great job of distilling the art and science of behavioral change. I talk about him and his wisdom, BJ Fogg, Tiny Habits, um, Charles Duhigg's Power of Habit, but Atomic Habits is phenomenal. And then to your point, um, creating those small wins, you know, and and finding the way to to win is so important. And BJ Fogg makes a really important point um, in his great book that A lot of times from a psychology perspective, we get to a Mm -hmm. point where we've tried so many times and we've failed so many times that we kind of 
we're a little burned out or we want to give up and we think something's wrong with us. And he says, well, look, maybe it's not a character flaw. Maybe nothing's wrong with you per se. Maybe it's a design flaw. Maybe you haven't been taught how to install and delete um, habits and behaviors that, that may work for you or not be working for you. And if you just learned how to do it, and then he presents his model that I talk about in the book, and he talks about, of course, James Clear does his own thing on that. Um, and there are very, very practical, um, frankly, easy to learn tools to get better at installing and deleting habits. And it's a really important skill to build. Um, and you hit on some of the um, the aspects of it, of creating momentum and creating wins. Um, and again, getting that agency back and the self-confidence that you can do it, you know? Mm. I love this because like when you're talking about those, those small wins and those fundamentals, like you say, like, let's go. I love that. Like when you, when you motivate yourself or you get motivated, were there things that like, let's say somebody's like, I don't want to go to sleep at this time, Brian, I don't want to eat this type of food. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, do this type of exercise. Like when you say the do's and don'ts, that's where they start. Do you ever like, I mean, sometimes I, if I could certain say the term, like, what do you do to kick yourself in the rear? You know, sometimes like, do you, is there certain things like certain activities, like you practice like pain, day that says, pain is a great, I mean, look, pain and suffering. So mm -hmm. we've got an 11 year old and a six year old, um, which I'll get to in a moment of making the connection between certain behaviors and certain outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I have felt what it feels like to want to end my own life. I know what mm -hmm. that feels like, right? And I know that at that time, I had none of these skills. I had none of the wisdom, none of the discipline, none of the self-love for my and, and the courage and all the other virtues that I talk about. I don't like feeling like that. I much prefer feeling like this. And I can also make a connection between certain behaviors and how I feel minutes or hours or days after those behaviors. So things like sleep are no longer chores for me. I'm not bitching about going, turning things off and getting a good night of sleep. It's not a chore for me. It's a gift I'm giving myself. So oftentimes people need to do two things. It's not that most of us need to suffer more because most of us are suffering more than enough, but we need to make the connection between the choices we're making or the default reality we're living in that is unhealthy and the choices we need to make in order to feel better. And then those become gifts we give to ourselves. And then what? Well, Again, then you can look at it a bunch of different ways. The ancient Stoics said, well, what do you want? Do you want a good mood, hedonic joy, and you feel good for five minutes, then you're hung over the next day or five, five hours, whatever it is? Or do you want a good life? And the reality is, in order to create a good life of sustainable joy, we need to make some decisions that are more in line with how we want to feel. And this is what we teach our kids. My kids don't like to be sick. They've never taken an antibiotic, 11 and 6. But, you know, they get a little runny nose or whatever, and they don't like that. Oh, let's rewind and let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, that food that you had with grandma over there and it did this, that, that's what happens. They know what sugar does, what insulin's doing to shuttle that toxin out of the bloodstream. And when you do it too much, then this happens and that. I mean, they've made the connection between mm -hmm. lifestyle choices and the downstream effects of it. And that's really important. And then it becomes joyful. It's not another chore. And I'm not saying do this and don't do that. I'm suggesting an individual thinks about when they were at their best and what they were doing and not doing. And then we need to decide, do we want to feel great? And do we want to make our prior best, our new baseline and create a life of deep meaning and joy and flourishing and be the change we want to see, support our families, et cetera, or not? And if you don't want to, you wouldn't be this far into an interview like this. So everybody who's listening to this is there. And now I think it's a matter of, well, what exactly do I want? Getting clear on that. Who do I aspire to be? Um, and then what things do I need to change? And then then it's exciting. Then it's let's go. But dude, I'm lazy all the time. And, and I'm not far from perfect. Bring my wife in. She'll tell you all, all about that, you know. But, you know, uh, there's something powerful about not feeling like it and doing it anyway. Yeah. And, I, and those I, I, are not my best days, dude, where it's like, man, the old me would have done something dumb and the new me's not dominating it, but I'm I'm doing it. I'm, I'm doing it even when I don't feel like it. And then my highs are higher and my lows are higher. And I, again, I've been able to see that I still have highs and lows, but I don't have this anymore. And the scaffolding is built 
And so, you know, when I find myself getting a little wobbly, it's all right, let's recommit. Let's get in. Um, and again, it becomes fun. It becomes a game rather than something we're begrudgingly doing, you know? Oh, I, I think I love the um the the concept of allowing your pain to be a motivator. And I think that's really like even in my life, like I think I've reached a certain age where um many of you out there listening would say, man, I, you know, I don't want to drink too much because I just feel horrible the next day. Or, you know, when I eat that, you know, you know, baked good and my stomach hurts. And really it's like, are we aware enough to listen? Like, that's the biggest thing. It's like, if, if your body's too dumbed down, if I can use that terminology where you can't feel, that's a whole other story. You have to be cleansing your body to where you actually can feel. And may, using pain as a motivator, that's the one thing that Literally, my friend is like the same, like in my office, it's like, I could tell him till I'm blue in the face, but eventually it just comes down to the fact, like, I just don't want to have this headache, you know? And then they realize like, here's the cause. And I really like that. I like that, um, that story you had about your kids, because that is where, when you start to become aware, right? Like when you start to become aware of what's going on, what creates pain, is that where, like within the book, you talk about how you start to become more aware and that's how you can unlock your potential. Like you can start to get an idea to grasp that heroic potential. Is that where it starts, you know, where you start to say, okay, this is what causes my pain. This is the, the focus of it. And this is how I can unlock this or describe it, how you put it in to your own words. Yeah. I mean, what, what comes to me is, um, so Joseph Campbell is one of my favorite heroes. He's on my wall back there. He's the leading scholar on, the mythology of heroes, basically. So when we go watch a heroic film starring whoever it is that you may be seeing, and I just watched Mission Impossible, right? So you got this hero that's going out facing all these extraordinary challenges. But anytime we're watching something like that, whatever it is for you, it's just showing you, you, you love it and you're pulled into it because that's you metaphorically represented on the screen. So all of us are called to be our best selves. All the ancient wisdom traditions talked about this. Maslow talked about it with his self-actualizer and the hierarchy of needs. Anyone this far in a conversation like this has ascended Maslow's hierarchy of needs to a point where their need to actualize their potential is as fundamental as their need to eat and breathe and get security and all those things. I wow. call it soul oxygen. And to the extent there's a gap between who you could be and who you are being, Maslow's relentless about this. He says, anytime you deviate from what you know you could be doing, it makes an imprint on your consciousness. And at the end of days in which you did not do the things you know you could do, you want to numb yourself at the end of those days. I want to numb myself at the end of those days. But when we close the gap, not perfectly, but more and more consistently, you feel a deep sense of meaning and joy. So yeah, we want to um, just pay attention. The call to adventure, to be heroic, um it's latent within all of us you know and then it's a matter of paying attention to it or not but again campbell you ignore that you're going to suffer so at what level do you need to suffer before you wake up and then start doing the things that that um don't make it easier by the way i'm not saying it's going to be easy i'm saying embrace the challenge and then go forge that anti-fragile confidence and give us all you got but that's a lot more quote, fun and enjoyable than, than avoiding the uh, necessary pain of life, you know, by building the discipline and all that good stuff. I, I think that's like when you say, like, if you understand, like many individuals out there, like, okay, here's the pain that can create, you know, like the next morning or the pain that can create this pain in the day. But when you become more aware and you realize like those small, like you say, increments of uh, maybe not making the correct choices that, you know, not paying attention to your pain, you have to look in the future like this is what's going to create this type of outcome and what you're saying is like are you wise enough are you are you um are you incorporating uh the ideas of wisdom in your heart to see the outcome how when we want to unlock that potential like what is the role of like cultivating wisdom like what would you say like how to cultivate your wisdom to be able to unlock your your heroic potential are there habits or traits that you see work well in your research yeah again in in, in my work i talk about first you got to know the ultimate game so most of us part of our innervation and burnout comes from running on a treadmill getting nowhere 
it's mm -hmm. called hedonic adaptation obviously you you keep on pursuing the things society has told you you need in order to be happy but you get there and you're like this isn't it david brooks calls it the two mountains you get up the top of the first mountain you achieved a certain level of success you look around and you're like what this is it well the mm -hmm. second mountain is the game we're talking about being a better person and all these different things um Stephen Covey said the same thing you get up to the top of the ladder you look around you put it on the wrong wall so wisdom starts with knowing the ultimate game knowing that the ultimate game is to be your best self in service to something bigger than yourself embodying certain virtues and engaging in certain behaviors such that you feel that deep sense of meaning and joy which was the ultimate purpose of of well all wisdom traditions again you live with arte in order to experience what Aristotle called the summum bonum of life, the greatest good, eudaimonia, which literally means good soul. We translate it as happiness, but it's something deeper, closer to flourishing. Oh, you feel this sense of uh, ineffable, like effervescent enthusiasm and joy for life. And, and we got to make the connection again between the things we're doing whether it's the binge watching or drinking or eating or whatever and is that giving you what you want in the big big picture so wisdom begins with stepping back an inch from our enculturation and saying um is what i'm doing working for what i want to see in my life and what i want to help bring forth in my kids and in my communities and if it is and keep on doing that then truly that's amazing um, and there are a lot of things you're doing that I'm sure are working with that. Um, mm -hmm. And there are other things that maybe you could start doing and things you could stop doing, just as there are for me and, and everyone else. Um, but that's wisdom. But then you got to put it in action. You can't just catalog these ideas. Um, you can't be a librarian of the mind, is how Donald Robertson, the great Stoic scholar and teacher, puts it. The ancients were, were warriors of the mind. You got to move from theory to practice, frame it up, wisdom. But then put it into action with the discipline um and again you you create a sense of um momentum and joy and agency um that's the essence of hope um which is a, an extraordinarily important virtue to cultivate um and that those are some now meandering thoughts on how i see wisdom as it can be applied in our lives i i mean i think that when we um when we talk about wisdom we talk about how to apply it to our lives. And I think that we we get to a point where we can actually see that how much we care about ourselves, how much we actually incorporate self-love and self-care, like that actually does pay off. I think because many times, like when I was younger, I thought, oh, you know, I, I get a cut, I heal, I'm okay, I'm going to just keep going forth. But now, like you say, wisdom would tell you, like, I need this much sleep or the people out there listening, they're like, no, I, I really do see that whenever I do this type of habit, I feel this way. And is there, um, how does it where you start to meld like the idea of self love or, you know, because some people will just think, yeah. oh, I just need to do this so I feel better. But I'm like, but they're, they don't necessarily connect like self love. Like it's like, no, this is actually cherishing. Like you just said, like you have to cherish things. Is that a big part of like, you know how people will develop their heroic like you have to develop a self-love or is it not a hundred percent no it starts and in the book i talk about a bunch of different forms of love so there's you know love 2.0 is a book by a woman i really admire named barbara fredrickson who talks about what she calls micro moments of positivity resonance there's like a neuroscience to love that you i feel that with you right now we're creating this this connection celebrating the ideas in one another and connecting and there's a, a neurological uh, fingerprint of what that looks like in our, you know, vagal tone and all the other things. So taking the time to find those moments rather than staring at our screen, go through the checkout line and connect with the individual human to human, walking by someone on a uh, running by, say hi, simple things, you know, um, that's love 2.0. Love 1.0 is relationships, you know, intimate relationships. But then I say love 0.0 is mm -hmm. you. It has to start with yourself. You can't give, I mean, you can, but you can't give and receive the love that you want unless you're giving and receiving it to yourself. And wow. for me, the way that I operationalize that is I do the things I know serve me the best. And there's fascinating research. You can put people into an, into an fMRI 
and you can have them think about themselves and a part of their brain will light up their self-center. Then you can have them think about a stranger and a different part of their brain will light up. But then the, the, the study is, all right, now think about your future self. Which part of your brain lights up? Your self-center or your stranger center? People who have made a connection to the choices they're making and their future selves, their self-center lights up. And they're going to have willpower, they're going to have more self-love, etc. People that don't make those connections, and again, you can cultivate these connections, their stranger self lights up. So of course they don't treat their future self with love because they're not even connected to it. So if you can wow. make the connection to the gifts that this version of you is lovingly giving to the tomorrow morning version of you, I mean, you don't need to wait 20 years, 20 minutes from now, I, my future self will appreciate whether how I treat my kids and whether I go in the cold plunge, like I said I would after we get off the talk. Like these are <laughs> gifts we're giving to ourselves, you know what I mean? And and anyway, we want to make those connections, but love is everything. And to be really clear, the hero in ancient Greece, mm -hmm. they named it hero. The word they used wasn't killer of bad guys or or tough guy or anything like that. The word they came up with for hero was protector. And a hero has strength for two, and a hero's secret weapon is love, full stop. So the reason I work as hard as I do is uh, I care. You know, I care about my kids, I care about my family, I care about my team, I care about my community, I care about our world. And then the hero does the hard work. They're not complaining about everything. Victims do that. They're deciding that they're going to do what they can, however humbly yet heroically, to meet life's challenges. Um, and that's an act of love all the way throughout the process for my family, for the community, for myself. Um, and again, now I'm saying a lot, but love is, is it's everything. Oh, yeah. And again, you hear yes. that, but you got to operationalize it, you know? I, I think you're saying great stuff. You're not saying too, you're saying even uh, not enough. But so I'm thinking. I think you could keep talking about this because I think that when you say the uh, the mechanisms of how you can incorporate love and how people out there, um, like you say, looking into your future self, and I find that in myself that that I've heard that even with healthcare. I'm going to start incorporating that with my patients because many times they think that I just want to get to a point where I don't feel this, like you say, headache, or I don't feel this digestive issue, but I need to get them to, like you say, see what best version of their future self could be like, you know, it's it's more than just not having a stomach ache. It's more than not. It's like, how do you thrive and how to like create potential? Like, I think that when you talked about like, um, like motivation, like it almost sounds like you're talking about like when individuals have courage, like you talk about being the hero with this, because I don't know, I think it really, I keep saying this day and age, it's, there's, there's certain people that look, uh, that can actually think of courage or like standing up for oneself and going forward could actually, I don't say look, be looked down upon. It's like, you know, there, we're in a culture where like, don't be too harsh or don't be too, you know, adamant about what you feel, but I like it in your book, you're talking about courage, like incorporating that courage, like the motivation. Are there things that when, you know, when you you look, you know, creating self-love, all right, Brian, do you, the courage, like, do you have, like, you look at your future self, do you have things that you personally do? Like, like, yep. yeah, I'm going to go help my family. I'm going to work hard for them. Is there a thing yep. that you tell your, your clients to do to like get their, yeah, their courage up? Dude, this is so good. So good. So then I look at two facets of love and, um, there's compassion and then there's encouragement for ourselves and for others. So first we need to have, and compassion means literally to suffer with, which is, is a really important um, virtue and an aspect of love, but it's incomplete. We need to move past just suffering with and seeing people who need compassion, no question, to encouraging ourselves and others to meet life's challenges with an agency, with a heroic power to make a difference. Um, but I think self-compassion is really important. There's a science to it. If you shame yourself, um, you're not going to do the things you want to do. You're just robbing yourself of all of your energy. So self-compassion is important. Um, there are three principles to it very briefly. One, common humanity, which I briefly touched on. When I used to tell myself something was wrong with me, I thought I was the only one who was scared of everything. 
and who didn't want to get out of bed and who it gives me tears in my eyes to imagine that version of myself. I thought it was just me. Common humanity is you're not alone, which is why I tell my story, which is why I pointed out the 80%. Anyone listening here, all of us suffer in one way or another or have family members who are acutely suffering. You're not alone is rule number one, common humanity. And that's important because then you take the pressure off yourself and we can figure out what we can do to move forward. Two is you got to be nice to yourself. When you inevitably do fall short of your standards and, and start beating yourself up, notice it, um, which is part three, be mindful and notice it. But self-compassion is really important. But then encouragement is really important. So I practice self-compassion all the time, um, very, very deliberately to remind myself, no, 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 dude, everyone feels this. You should feel it. Let's go. What do you need to do? But then encouragement, when I feel overwhelmed or afraid, which I do all day, every day, deliberately, I'm pushing my edges. I'm trying to live a heroic life. I'm facing dragons, which is rule number one, by the way, of, of objective two, forging anti-fragile confidence. It's supposed to be hard. Your story that it should be easy goes with the story that you should go after fame, wealth, and hotness. And if you ever have any problems, it's because you're an idiot and you haven't figured it out. All right, cool. No, dude, it's supposed to be hard. Now, when I experience <laughs> those things, when I'm uncomfortable, science says, my coach affirms, Phil Stutz, again, I love, I know that my infinite potential exists outside of my comfort zone. How do I feel when I leave my comfort zone? By definition, I feel uncomfortable. Now, nobody really loves to feel uncomfortable, the anxiety, the little stress, you know what I mean, all the overwhelmed feeling when you're uncomfortable. But you, we need to make the connection that that's where your growth occurs. So rather than avoid all the things that make you feel uncomfortable, you want to wisely, and it's not crazy, but wisely, when you feel those things, approach them. One of the mantras science uses and, and scientists use and... Um, yeah, Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for her study of telomerase, um, you know, obviously that protects telomeres, etc. She tells us how you perceive life's challenges will affect your very DNA's expression and, and all of that good stuff at the biological level. If you avoid it, you're going to have a threat response. If you say, and this is the practice, bring it on. You lean into your challenges. You know that they're fuel for your growth. It's like going to the gym and lifting real weights rather than styrofoam weights. So I literally say to myself, bring it on. Bring it on. This is what I train for. That's going to make me stronger rather than make it go away or something's wrong with me because I'm facing another challenge. Well, no, of course I am. I'm trying to do good things. Um, whether that's have a great marriage, which is tied for first is the most challenging thing in my life with raising two great kids, 11 and six years old, who have a lot of energy, or building a business I'm proud of, or launching our book right now, um, I wanna bring it on. I wanna encourage myself, and then I wanna inject that courage into others. But Aristotle said courage is the most important virtue. It's the virtue that vitalizes all the others. It comes from the same root as heart. So mm -hmm. just like your heart pumps blood to your arms and legs and vital organs, courage, vitalizes all your other virtues. And again, the source of courage is love. I get my deepest courage from everyone, from my mom, you know, who, who encouraged me as a young boy to give my gifts to the world, to my wife and all the support she gives me, to you right now, dude, like helping me bring out hopefully some, some wisdom that can help people. Like it's a beautiful dance um, that I'm experiencing right now, you know, that we want to deliberately mindfully create um, that's again, saying a lot of, and hitting it a lot of different aspects of it. Oh, I, I mean, I love it because I can tell that when we talk about how you have gratitude, you can tell that like hope and gratitude about, uh, looking for the potential within yourself is something that motivates you, but it should be something that motivates all of us. Like you say, like with the hope, how big a role, like when you say you have the courage What's the connection between like, you know, I have courage, I'm going to, I'm going to practice courage, being courageous and hope. Like, like, is there something that just, yep. you activate hope in that sort of, yeah, with your dude, courage? you're hitting all my favorite themes. So hope there's, there's a science to hope. 
And hope is unbelievably important. If you do not have hope, and we'll talk about the three ways you build hope, if you do not have hope, you're literally hopeless, which is one step away from depressed. And you feel helpless, hopeless, etc. So cultivating hope in a grounded, scientifically powerful manner is another key aspect of everything I do with our coaches and our app and in the book. So the three aspects of hope go like this. One, hopeful people can see a better future. So we need to have a vision for a better future and ideally a specific target we're aiming at. Whether it's um, one of the things we have our coaches get to is a 0.5 waist to height ratio. You know, it's the number one predictor of morbidity from my understanding. In order to be a certified heroic coach, you need to be at that or moving toward that. Whole nother conversation on how health practitioners wow. often are not healthy. Well, I'm sorry, but how are you qualified to help me get in my health if you haven't got yourself? But what's your, <laughs> what's your target? You want to see a better future. And this is also why I, I connect people to their prior success. You want to have those, those hero bars, we call them, leaning on what David Goggins is, calls cookie, he calls them cookie jars, where you can reach in and see how you succeeded in the past. But you want to see a better future. That's part one. Part two is you want to have agency, which means you think you can actually make that future come to life. And three, you need to have a plan. And you need to be willing to pursue multiple pathways. You need all three of those, a vision of a better future, a sense that you can create it, and a plan to create it. Um, and if you don't have hope, you're missing one of those three elements. And we just need to do the work to tighten up some things and get it working again, because you have felt hope in the past, and we need to activate that again. Um, and that's essential, no question about it. Hope and courage, they're, they're distinct, but they're very, very um, closely related. And, um, and again, the important point here is you can build it. These are, are cultivatable skills that will improve your life radically as you master them. And that's what I love about the book, my friend. Um, it's like you go through and you teach people how to cultivate them, how to start them. Um, you know, even if it's like the, the initial thought, the initial action, then leading into the repetitive, you know, consistency. Um, what else? Like I always say that whenever, we look about unlocking your heroic potential. Are there the other tidbits that we're talking about? Like, you know, there's so many like, uh, I mean, I love it that you talked about even about caffeine because we talk about like coffee. We talk about circadian rhythms. We've You talk about cold baths and there's other ones. Like, I even love the, the chapter you had about the ego. I'm just saying like, what are just a, like, what is one other thing that you think the individuals out there, like they could learn or a few things that, that is not what the cover says it's going to cover. Yeah. No, I mean, the seventh objective is one of my favorites too. Probably the second and the seventh, anti-fragile confidence and then activating your superpower. So we yeah. playfully you know, talk about the fact that you have a superpower and it's the exact same superpower that all of your favorite heroes have. Who are your favorite heroes, Chris? Who comes to mind? Um. Oh my goodness. I, you hit me right on the spot. Um. I mean, I have like health heroes. Um, if you could, like I'm serious, like one of them is Dr. Dowdy. He's my my mentor. He's one of my heroes. He's just very, very smart guy and he's a visionary. Um, and I mean, I could have a few other, but I know that's the first one that comes to mind. Yeah. Give me one more, just so I have two that I can play with. Um, man, you gotta be good. Uh, it's not that I don't have heroes, I think I have a lot of them. Um one of them is like I, I'm sorry. I have a lot of people that that suffer. I, I I'm sorry. I I like when I have people that that go through suffering and they really they learn how to make themselves better. And I'm sorry if I, I'm drawing a blank, but you put me on the spot here. Who'd be a good hero? I mean, superheroes. No, I'm not. Man, sorry, brother. I'm trying to think of a good one. I am putting you on the um, spot. You're fine. What do we got? Just throw one out, dude. No pressure. Uh, uh, Spider Man. Sorry, I'm gonna say. Oh, perfect. No, no, this is great. So we got Spider-Man and Dr. Dowdy. This is great. So anyone listening, you think about your heroes. I got, if you're watching, you know, I got a bunch of my heroes on the wall. But the yeah. point I want to make is if you imagine your heroes, they're very different. So Dr. Dowdy is very different than Spider-Man, right? And obviously Spider-Man's fictional. But the two examples I like to use, I got Gandhi on my wall that you can see, and I got Churchill above him and you can't see him. Now they mm -hmm. come from the same era, right? And they're as different as they can possibly be. Gandhi wears a loincloth, 
part of the palace. He goes days without talking. He's frail, you know, and all these things. Um, Churchill, you know, rarely stopped talking. He's portly, you know, he's this nationalistic, you know, iconoclastic guy. They don't even like each other, Gandhi and Churchill, literally. Yeah. So they're as different as they can be, but I like to say they have the exact same quality in common, which is in their presence, they had a soul force. They had a moral charisma about them that you can feel. And again, ancient Chinese philosophers, not again, but ancient Chinese philosophers talked about the same thing. Wu Wei is their equivalent, roughly, of eudaimonia. Wu Wei, as you almost certainly know, means effortless action, but it means something closer to effortless right action or effortlessly virtuous action or effortlessly being your best self. And the ancient Chinese philosophers like Lao Tzu and Confucius cultivated the ability for their leaders to show up in that um, best state because people want to follow those people. There's a neuroscience to this. Anyway, when you are living in integrity with your highest values and doing the little things you know are best for you, you have a moral charisma. You have what Gandhi called soul force. Martin Luther King talked about it in his I Have a Dream speech, soul force. That's the universal hero's power that we all have latent within us. You have it. It's what you admire. You have it now, and it's also what you admire in Dr. Dowdy, what Spider-Man embodies heroically, what Churchill and Gandhi and Eleanor Roosevelt embody. On my wall, Marcus Aurelius is another one of my heroes. All of these human beings have that quality, and that's ultimately what I think we need to activate within ourselves that I think literally will change the world. It's what Gandhi said. It's what MLK said. Um, that's the ultimate end point of everything that I do. Um, and if enough of us do the hard work, no qualifications on it, do the hard work to show up, to cultivate this strength for two, guided by love and a commitment to something bigger than ourselves, I believe that we can fundamentally um, change the world together, one person at a time, starting with us. And then we're back to you. Today's the day. Oh, let's go. Um, let's but go. That's, that's yeah, that's the end kind of um point of the book. Oh man, I I, I want to encourage everybody out there to pick up Arte um because of not only the wisdom, but also the practicality. I love practicality. I love like taking ideas and then being able to implement them. And it goes through that really great stories too. Like, really, I was going through this and I was like, you know, I wish I could be a storyteller like you. And uh, but I, I I know how much of a nerd I am to where, like, I just, you know, I'm looking at something like, oh, this equals this and this. But you do it in a way that you like you do give it the equals, but it's in a very nice format. So um, everybody, please check it out. And Brian, where do we can where can we find you? I want people to know where you are on social media. What's your website? Where can we find you? Yeah, I appreciate it, Chris. Um so heroic.us is the website uh the book is kind of an expression of what i've done over the last 25 years so we have a, an app called heroic you can find in the ios and android um, app stores in which i talk about a lot of these ideas we help you build the protocol and do the things on a daily basis um, that we talked about and then the book heroic.us slash book um, we've got, you know, free, whatever you want to call it, introduction, the audio book and, and all this different stuff you can listen to. And then on Amazon, Barnes and Noble and all the other obvious places, um, you can pick up the book if you feel so inspired, but I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Bless you. Appreciate all you're yeah. doing, all your, your, um, your team's doing, we're customers, we're fans and, uh, just been an honor and uh, grateful to be here today. I, I want to say thank you. Um, Courtney wishes she could be on here with us today, but she had like her internet just went just down the drain. And so she was like, I can't be on there. I was like, you can't. And she said, that's still not working. But from all of us, though, I really am just very thankful for this because it's really like eye opening to people out there listening right now. When you guys feel stuck, if you feel like you can't move forward, please check this book out. And Brian, I can just tell you, you have a sweetheart, a good spirit. And I can tell you love people. So people out there need people like you. And you know what? That's what we like to have here on the on the podcast. So we're going to send you all the things in the show notes. We're going to promote this. And I hope that we stay friends, man. I mean, I stay as and stay in touch. And I can tell you, you'd be like a really great person just to be in contact with. So from all of us here at the Ancient Health Podcast, thank you, Ron, so much. Chris, I appreciate you. And um, looking forward to uh, many more connections. And uh, again, appreciate all you do and your great work. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.